Hey everybody, you're listening to Dead Ideas, the podcast of extinct thoughts and practices. Today we are capping off our monster-length epic series on the medieval Irish geish. Today's story, The Destruction of Dajerga's Hostel, a truly badass epic from medieval Irish literature, which is, in my opinion, the pulp fiction of Irish heroic literature. That's what we're talking about today on Dead Ideas. Thanks for listening, everybody. We're concluding our giant series on the Irish Geish, a kind of sacred personal rule that kills you. For more on that, see our previous episodes. But basically, it's a personal rule that's placed on you, like Cahollan couldn't eat dog meat, for example, or King Conora couldn't walk clockwise around his capital. And if you break the rule, fate basically squashes you like an ant under its finger. And we're going to see that last one in action in our story today, which is a medieval Irish heroic epic, parts of which probably date from the 6th to 7th centuries, judging by the mixture of Middle Irish and Old Irish, making it one of the oldest extant works of Irish heroic literature. It's called the Togol Brijna Dajerga, or the Destruction of Dajerga's Hostel. Now a hostel, as Andre told us earlier in the series, was a sort of guest house or rest stop where travelers could stay, and it was largely for the upper class because they were mainly the ones who had money to travel around a lot. And Dajerga is the owner of one such hostel, and one translation of Dajerga's name is the Blood Red God. So the most metal translation of this epic's title would be the destruction of the hostel of the Blood Red God. So we're not picturing like a youth hostel here. It's no, not... not Australian backpackers. Okay. Although it's actually more close than I thought it would yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now this, as I said, is, in my opinion, the pulp fiction of Irish heroic literature. You know how in pulp fiction, it's about two badass gangsters having the worst effing day of their life? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the story of a badass king, King Conora who likewise has the worst day of his life and in the end meets his grisly demise, which is, of course, in true medieval Irish fashion, brought about by the breaking of Gesa. Now, usually, for these Public Domain Theater 3000 episodes, it's just me and I don't read them beforehand so that you and I encounter it together for the first time, but that didn't really work out for this one when I tried it. It was just really hard to follow because medieval literature was not written for modern literary sensibilities. It was not meant to be read like a novel, but rather it's performed in front of an audience who already knows the story, who answers the riddles that are posed therein, who cheers for the heroes and jeers at the villains. So I actually have an audience for us today. I've got co-hosts. Thank you for joining us once again, Nick. Ooh! (laughs) And Anna. Yay! All right, very good. Very good cheering and jeering. Uh, Thank you for being on the show once again. Thanks for having us. Of course... Also, in medieval Irish performance of these things, the performer might very well take some liberties to tailor the story to suit his or her audience. So I have likewise taken some liberties as well and rewritten the destruction for a modern audience. So we'll it's all going to be about Australian backpackers. Maybe. Yeah, Maybe. punch it up with a car chase. <laughs> oh, there'll be a there'll be a chase. Oh, yeah. <laughs> chariots? Ah, uh, there are chariots in it. But not a chariot chase. Uh, maybe. It's hard to tell. It okay. doesn't explain. I will still be reading snippets from the actual text of the Whitley Stokes translation of the actual piece, but by and large, this will be The Destruction of Dejerigo's Hostel, as directed by Quentin Tarantino. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. All right, so let's have it. Now, the opening scene is where I really take liberties, because since this is the Quentin Tarantino version, mm-hmm. we have to start with the ending, right? Okay. So <laughs> this is a story, of course, about the death of King Conara at the hands of a marauding horde of plunderers who kill him while he's staying at this guest house or hostel. 
So allowing for a dash of poetic license here, here's the opening scene. So picture this. The plunderers burst into the hostel and yell, Everybody be cool! This is a plundering! <laughs> 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 then they kick down a door, and they meet eyes with the king himself, Konara, along with two of his retainers, who are also in the same room. And they've all been asleep, so they're just standing there in their linen frocks, right? And their weapons and their armor are in a corner out of reach, but they're frozen, right? In this kind of like Mexican standoff moment, right? right? Okay. The king and his retainers, they put their hands up. But by the look of them, it's clear that they could probably break your neck with their bare hands if they needed to, right? And the plunderers brandish their blades at them, but the king just gives a steely stare and says, This isn't the first time I've had a sword pointed at me. <laughs> Does he sound like, like Samuel L. Jackson? He, very much so. Oh, okay, I, just, I was wondering if one yeah. was Samuel L. I just, Jackson. I just can't do the voice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the plunderers nervously scan the room, and they see a pile of wallets on the nightstand and say to the king, which wallet is yours? And the king says, it's the one that says otherworldly motherfucker on it. Yeah! <laughs> it's the one that says otherworldly motherfucker on it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, so that's the opening scene, right? End scene. And King Konara is, in fact, an otherworldly dude. And you see, in any of the pre-modern epics, whether you're talking about ancient Greece or India or wherever... If you want to make your character seem really badass, what you have to do is tell their lineage and give them some kind of divine parentage. Well, yeah. yeah. Yes. And Konora has otherworldly blood on both sides of his family. Ooh. Hot damn. Yes. So now we have to cut, like in a Quentin Tarantino style, where like there's like a title to like the new scene, right? <laughs> <laughs> so now we go to Konora's lineage. <laughs> So first off, his great-grandmother was an elf maiden who was ravishingly beautiful. In fact, the opening scene of the actual text of the destruction is his great-grandfather, the king of Ulster, laying eyes on her for the first time as she undoes her hair to wash it at a well. And he is dumbstruck. <laughs> exactly. That's certain female. <laughs> they get married, of course. So Konara, who will descend from this union, has elf blood on his mother's side. What's okay? his hair look like? Otherworldly. Well, otherworldly, probably, yeah. Konara's hair is blonde. I know that. Okay. I remember that. Okay. So anyway. Meanwhile... His father is otherworldly as well. His mother, descended from the elf maiden, is a princess who has this whole kind of Rapunzel thing going on. She gets shut up in this wickerwork house that has no door and only a high window and a skylight. And one night, there is a bird that flies into the skylight. He comes in, she looks at the bird, and suddenly the bird transforms into a man. What then, kind of bird? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of important. It is for you. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, I think any woman would be... No, never mind. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if she cared what genus it was from. So you're not just going to go for, like, a pigeon? No, don't give it up for pigeons. They're dirty. <laughs> Should we say it's a raven? Yeah, all right. All right, let's make it a raven. They're dirty birds. From genus Corvus Corvidae or something? Corvus Corvax. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so now it's a raven bird, man. So anyway, the raven flies in, transforms into a man, and without any exchange of words, bam, they're in bed. He possesses her, as the text says. See, that's why you don't want it to be a pigeon. Just because there's just all the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. The whole time. Probably not make for a very good sex scene. No. 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 <laughs> so anyway, and, and this is more than a foot massage, okay? <laughs> It's one of the eruption stones of the raven. I don't know. Well, that's... Anyway, when they're done, the birdman says that she is now pregnant, of course, and he further reveals that the king of Tara, who is the high king of right. all Ireland, the over king, yep. is coming to take her as his bride. But secretly, the child will be his, the birdman's, and it will be a son, and his name shall be Konara. And it shall be Geish for him to kill birds. Ooh. Mm 
So he places a geisha on him straight right. away. And she's like, call me? <laughs> He's like, no, I'm out of here. Call, call. What about, okay, so like, did you, you're not going to play in for child support? I'm just thinking. You're marrying a king. Well, yeah. I hooked you up. He'll, he'll bring her bits of Ow! straw for her nest. Mm, yeah. I guess. Okay. Little bits of eyes. So, Konora is the issue of both elf blood on his mother's side and this birdman blood on his father's side. And for the medieval Irish, this would be a clear signal that this person was destined for greatness. Clearly, he is destined to become a badass. And he does. He becomes king, in fact. Here is how it happens. <laughs> One day, when Konora is young, we don't know how young, but young enough that he can't grow a beard yet. Beardlessness is always a thing in these stories. I've noticed. You know, okay. ravens grow beards. I'm just throwing that out. Ah, okay. So anyway, he's playing with his sling when he comes upon a magnificent flock of birds. And he starts to chase them, and they fly out to sea, but he follows them into the water. And he uses his sling, he puts a rock in his sling, and he makes like, twirls it around like he's going to cast at them. And at that point... The flock of birds turns into birdmen, and they turn on him with swords and spears and are about to attack him. But one among the birdmen lurches forward and protects him from the others and says, No, we shall not harm this one. And he then introduces himself as Nevglan, king of the birdmen. And he tells Konora that he must not cast at birds or he'd be killing his own father's men. And this mm. is a signal that Konora, the gears start turning, he realizes, wait a minute, you mean, oh, like, you're my father? This is like the Luke, I am your father kind of moment right. in the story. <laughs> the sex scene gets even weirder when you think it's a seagull, too. Oh, God, <laughs> no, God. Stop ruining my paranormal romance. <laughs> okay. So anyway, at that point, Nevglan reveals that the king of Tara has just died. But a druid has prophesied that a naked man walking on the road to Tara with a stone in his sling would become the next king. So, again, Konora, the gears start Being turning. The guy strips down. <laughs> exactly. So he goes naked on the road to Tara with a stone in his sling. And when the people see him, they're like, ah, crap. <laughs> they see this beardless little runt coming at him. Pantsless and... morons, our new king. Yay, <laughs> you know, all he has is just a stone and a sling. Like when Cahoolan was seven, he could throw up a ball, throw a spear at it, <laughs> run, catch the ball and catch the spear, and then just do it again for funsies. Yeah, so like, oh, man. And here's the actual words from the Stokes translation. They say, It seems to us that our bull feast and our spell of truth, which produced the prophecy, right. are a failure if it be only a young beardless lad that we have visioned therein. Hang on, guys, hang on. I'm also the illegitimate offspring of a lady and a seagull. Huh? Well, no, that is what he says. <laughs> oh, boy, brother, seriously. So Conora says, This is of no moment. For a young, generous king like me to be in the kingship is no disgrace, since the binding of Tara's pledge is mine by right of father and grandsire. Mm. So he's like, A... I have both the king of Ulster on one side and the king of Tara on the other. And subtext, I have also otherworldly parentage on both sides, too. So he basically, he's like, the kingship is mine, bitches. Bam! And drops the mic. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and at that point, you know, people kind of like, okay, well, you know. Kind of like how Americans are now. Kind of like, well, we'll see how the next eight years yeah. go. <laughs> we must ensure a peaceful transition. Drunk under a table, yeah. in the dark. We'll give the naked kid a chance to rule. Yeah. But but Conra, in all fairness, he also says that he will take the counsel of the wise so that he may himself also become wise. And finally, he reveals the eight gesa that his bird father gave him while he was in the sea that day. Ooh. Yes, so there shall be restrictions upon his reign, according to his father. And so here are the eight gesa that he must follow or doom will befall. Okay. Number one, he must not go right-hand-wise round Tara, which is his capital, 
nor left-hand wise round Bregia, which must be another city or town. Okay. Number two, the evil beasts of Kerna must not be hunted by thee. You can't hunt evil beasts? Can't that's, hunt evil beasts. I think that's kind of a big part of being a king. Yeah, it? really. <laughs> Necessarily. Number three, and thou shalt not go out every ninth night beyond Tara. So you can't stay away from your capital too long, basically. Okay. No more than nine nights. So much for spring break. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Number four, thou shalt not sleep in a house from which firelight is manifest outside after sunset, and in which light is manifest from without. So you can't be in a house where people can see you because you got a light lit, and so they could see you from the outside. This sounds suspicious to like something that might happen in a hospital. <laughs> I guess no. you sleep in a grain silo now. <laughs> okay, Yay! Yeah. Well, you see how Irish literature works, yes. Uh, number five, and three reds shall not go before thee to red's house. Which is just kind of like a baffling, like, uh, kind of one. He looks at his dad and he's like, I'm just reading it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> number six, and no rapine, which is another word for, like, plunder or, like, raiding and thieving. Oh, yeah. Rapine. Yeah, rapine. And no rapine shall be wrought in thy reign. So no plunder in your reign. Which we already know from the first scene is going to go badly. That's going to go badly, yes. Number seven. And after sunset, a company of one woman or one man shall not enter the house in which thou art. This is something like dorm restrictions. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> right. And, and no alcohol on the premises exactly. unless you are over 21. Unless you live in a substance-free dorm, thou shalt not. <laughs> Your music has to stop at 10. <laughs> it can stop at 12 on weekends. Right. And the last one, number eight. And thou shalt not settle the quarrel of thy two thralls, which I gather is like subjects, including like the yeah. other lords under you, basically anyone else. Oh, under okay. You. So it's not just like... Slave social class. It's... Yeah, no, it seems more like like the people under you. Okay. Yeah. So you can't adjudicate for your own vassals? Exactly. Weird. Also a yeah. problem with being king. Yeah. yeah. Part of your job. Yeah. It's a little off. So these are the geisha that are placed on King Konara, and as long as he keeps them, his reign is a paradise. It goes on for paragraphs in this text about how wonderful it was. Even but... though we can't hunt you, will be sore judge. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, but remember, this is, of course, the pulp fiction of Irish heroic literature. So just like Jules and Vincent in Pulp Fiction having the worst day of their gangster lives, this is ultimately the story of this king's worst day of his life, right? And presumably the day where he breaks all his gesha. Yeah, you are exactly correct. If you break them all, does it sort of cancel each other yeah, out? Yeah, do you shoot the moon Unf that way? Unfortunately, yeah. no. no. Just like Destiny's like, damn, son. <laughs> <laughs> so how does all this come about? Well, as you guessed, it turned on his gesha. <laughs> Okay, so remember that there's a geish against plunder in his reign. Yeah. yeah, okay. But here's the problem. Konara has three foster brothers who are the sons of a plunderer named Dondesha. So they're the sons of Dondesha. And here's the thing about medieval Ireland. It was like custom that sons should always follow in their father's footsteps, even if those footsteps lead you into illegal activity. It's still really? like the, the expected thing, the right thing, the honorable duty-bound thing to follow your father's profession. Their father was a plunderer, but now they got this bratty little king, their foster brother no less, who says, no plundering? What? Well, what are we supposed to do? So they're stuck. Right? They're honor-bound on the one hand to follow their foster brother's expectation that they do no plundering. On the other hand, they're also honor-bound to follow in their father's footsteps and plunder. So they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, which is how these things often tend to go in Irish literature. So you go fuck up the Vikings. Well, but that's still kind <laughs> of... Yeah, well, they go? Well, you'll see. So, okay, so what they do, they decide to test Conorah. To see if he's really, you know, going to do anything if they actually, you know, raid and plunder. So they decide to just do, like, a little, just kind of petty raiding. They're just going to make off with some cattle from a farmer's farm. Just, you know, basically, it's the equivalent of, like, knocking over a 7-Eleven. Just to see what he does, right? So they do that. And then the farmer goes to the king and complains. But the king tells the farmer, go talk to the sons of Dondesha 
and basically work it out amongst yourselves. I can't see the key between you. Yeah, ah, exactly. Ah, nice. So the sons of Dondesha see this and realize that, oh, this King Conora, yeah, he, he's just a paper tiger. He's not going to do anything. So they go full marauder all over Ireland, right? And they start plundering all across the countryside. Well, this, of course, can't stand because he also has the guess that there can't be any plundering. So he has his men track them down and haul them their whole raiding party into his court. And following the law, he sentences them all to death. But before they're executed, he says, wait a minute, the three foster brothers, I will spare their lives, but I am going to exile them to Britain and they can do their plundering over there. Everybody else gets executed, but my three foster brothers can live. They're just exiled. And this turns out to be a fatal mistake because in Britain, the Foster Brothers fall into some bad company. Worst company? British. <laughs> <laughs> they meet up with a certain Saxon prince named Inkel the One-Eyed. Now here's the description we get from Stokes on okay. Inkel. Inkel the One-Eyed, great-grandson of Conmec. Wide as an ox hide was the single eye protruding from his forehead, with seven pupils therein. What? Yes which were black as a chafer, each of his knees as big as a cauldron, each of his two fists was the size of a reaping basket, his buttocks as big as a cheese on a withy. <laughs> <laughs> and a withy is some kind of like a willow branch or something that you okay. use for like basket weaving or stuff. Or mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so a cheese on a stick. Yeah. A cheese wheel on a oh stick. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is getting a little Mad Maxie now. It's almost time bad it's in its in its exaggeration. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now this Inkel offers them a deal. Offers a deal to the sons of Dondesha that have an exile, right? Sounds more like a Fomorian than a Saxon. Pretty close, yeah. Uh he says that he will help them plunder his own family's royal house in Britain if they will in turn show him to his choice of target to plunder in Ireland. He's mm. like Ooh. I'll show you mine if you show me yours, basically. <laughs> and the sons of Dondesha are like, that sounds pretty good. Okay. So they agree, and Inkel shows them the way to his family's hall. And in the ensuing raid, the sons of Dondesha make off with great riches, and all of Inkel's family, including his mother, his father, and all of his siblings, are slaughtered. And at the end of it, Inkel just stands there looking at them with a crazed grin. He's got like the blood spatter all over his face. And the sons of Dondesha just look at each other with trepidation because they know that now it's time He's for them to divorce. make good on their end of the bargain and help him plunder in Ireland. Okay, we go now to the next scene. Title card, The Dominoes Fall. <laughs> This is where everything starts to go wrong for King Conora with his Gesa. So we cut now back to Ireland to King Conora. So he's kicking back with his feet up on his desk and everything, right? And he's like, whew, I'm glad that that thing with my foster brothers went over okay. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing could possibly go wrong <laughs> now. <laughs> but of course, things do go wrong. <gasps> it's a surprise, right? No! Yes. And this is basically the part of the movie where they accidentally shoot Marvin in the face. Because <laughs> this is where it all goes to hell. <laughs> and here is how it happens. What do they call a Big Mac in Ireland? <laughs> so here, now we can go to the Stokes translation actual okay. text. Great. In Conora's reign, there was perfect peace in Erin, which is another name for Ireland. Save that in Thomond, there was a joining of battle between the two Carvers, Two foster brothers of his were they, so more foster brothers of Conora. And until Conora came, it was impossible to make peace between them. So there's some kind of lords underneath him, right? It was a taboo, I guess, mm -hmm. of Conora's to go to separate them before they had repaired to him, come to him asking for help. He went, however, although to do so was one of his taboos. So now with our running counter, we'll have a mm -hmm. counter like on the bottom of the screen of like gay broken. <laughs> so that's number one. You can yes. hear a little ding sound as it yes. goes over. Ding! Gay breaking number one. Yes. 
And, and then, as he was doing this, he remained five nights with each of the two. And so five plus five is it's how many ten. nights? Ten, mm -hmm. which is exceeds the maximum limit of nine nights outside of Terra. So, ding! Gase break number two. Just sees Birdman dead face palming. <laughs> exactly. And then after settling these two quarrels, he was traveling back to Tara. Okay, so this is from the Stokes translation, too. Mm -hmm. This is the way they took past Usnek of Meath. And they saw the raiding from east and west, and from south and north. And they saw the war bands and the hosts. So, like, things are just suddenly going to hell in a handbasket right. all across Ireland suddenly. And the men stark naked. I don't know why they're naked, but they are. <laughs> and the land of the southern O'Neills, which was one of the most powerful clans. Yeah, they were the high kings, mostly, right? During medieval Ireland, the northern O'Neills and the southern O'Neills were, like, the major powers yeah. of Ireland. Yeah. In the land of the Southern O'Neills was a cloud of fire around him. So it's like, shit, that happened fast, yeah. right? It's got a bit biblical, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Conara says, what is this? And his guys with him, his retinue, says, easy to say, his people answer. Easy to know that the king's law has broken down therein, since the country has begun to burn. And he's like, oops. <laughs> And then Conora says, Whither shall we betake ourselves? To the northeast, says his people. <laughs> the land has begun to burn and your shit's falling apart. Let's go to the northeast. Go to the northeast. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, there's less smoke that way. Yeah. Go to the cabin. It'll yeah. be great. No one's quite so naked. But the consequence of that, so they went right hand wise round Tara and left hand wise round Bragia. So, bing! Bing! Three. <laughs> Case break number Those three. Two individual ones? Or are they all the, like that was giant, one together as one okay. case. Yeah. At this point, the powers of the other world are getting majorly pissed at Konara for breaking all these, and they actually start to actively influence him to break more of his Gesa to speed him further toward his doom. Right. This is you're doing this. It's annoying us. Do more of it. <laughs> get so, it over with. So at that point, Konara and his men get hungry. And they begin to hunt, but the elves from the other world raise a magical mist around the beasts that they are hunting so they can't see clearly what they're shooting at. Oh, are they evil beasts of Serna? Uh-huh. Uh. So not until too late does Konora realize that he has hunted the evil beasts of Kerna. Bing! Gase break number four. What does an evil beast of Kerna taste like? Yeah. <laughs> like chicken. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Which he also Pretty can't game, kill, yeah. so... <laughs> so now things are getting really bad, and everybody in Ireland sees it, and... Basically, it's like the broken window effect where, like, you know, you see, like, oh, there are broken windows. I guess, you know, it's fine my, to just break everything now. Right. My neighbors are naked and going around in yeah. war bands and the lines of the Southern O'Neills are on fire. <laughs> Again, the Mad Max thing. Yeah. yeah, let's have some raping and plunder. So plundering breaks out all across Ireland. Bing! Mm -hmm. Gayest break number five. What are you going to do? Can you adjudicate for us? <laughs> exactly. Ooh, snap. <laughs> So now Conora finally realizes just how deep the shit is that he has got himself into. And he's like, well, where should we go now? And just like Jules and Vincent having accidentally shot Marvin in the face and, and having like a car that's basically got a window splattered with blood and like, we got to get this car off the road. They're like, we got to get to somewhere and just hunker down and be safe, right? And so Conora is like, wait, I know. There's this guy named Dajerga. And I gave him a whole bunch of gifts in the past, so I know that he's not going to turn me down. He's got this hostel where we can stay and everything's going to be cool. <laughs> he's like he's like saying to his retinue, he's like, really, seriously, guys, I got this. It's okay. Yeah. Don't desert me. I, it's going to be fine. Well, this is a bunch of naked people running around. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kind of losing it. No, no, seriously. Everything's going to be cool. We'll just get to the hostel and we'll be fine, right? Okay, so Dezerga is basically the fixer. He's the wolf. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right, one little problem, though. As they are riding to Dejerga's hostel, three riders in red pass them along the road. Uh-oh. And at that point, Kona remembers the Geish about not allowing three reds to precede him to the House of Red. And he realizes that Dejerga's name literally means in Irish, <clears throat> the blood red god. Ah! Snap. Crap. Uh. Yes. So so then there's this scene where he sends 
people ahead to try to bribe these Red Riders to not go in before him, but they refuse. We're tired, man. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this chase scene where he tries to catch up to them and get, get there before him, but he fails, and the Red Riders go in, and he realizes that three Reds have gone before him to the House of Red. Bing! Gay is right, number six. So he's like, well, shit. You could just not go in. Look, he wants, wants a shower. He wants a jacuzzi. Yeah, he he's a king. Play. He yeah, needs a king. place to stay. What's well, going to get worse? Besides, there's yeah. naked people running around burning things. It's true. What a, <laughs> At least in the hostel, you know, there's an ice machine. They'll throw some people out if it gets rowdy. Yeah. Have you, you've never stayed in a hostel, have you? No. <laughs> Self-evident, isn't it? <laughs> so he's like, well, shit. But okay, fine. Right? So finally, just after sunset, they reach the hostel, and they go inside. And they're like, okay, safe. But then, this old lady comes a-knocking on the hostel door. And she's like, hello? Are there any rooms left inside? Then, at that point, Kona remembers the geish. One woman or one man shall not enter the house that you stay in after mm-hmm. sunset. So he's like, oh, oh. So he answers the door. And he's like, okay, seriously, lady, please. Just just, just go somewhere else. Go to the next farmstead. I don't care. No one's going to refuse you. Just you can't stay here. Just please, please move along. But she's like, you're going to refuse hospitality to an old lady? An old lady? And so he's like, oh, fine. And he lets her in. Ding. Ding, gay sprite number seven. <laughs> you know, so much of this could just be solved by preemptively shooting people. The Foster <laughs> Brothers act up, shoot them! Yeah. So he's just got one left at this point, right? People he's ride broken heavy? all yeah. of his geysa except for the one. Now we cut scene. Okay. Next title card, The Fire from the Boats. So we're going now to the ships of the sons of Don Desha, coming mm-hmm. back from Britain from their plundering, coming back toward Ireland, right? And they've got Inkel with him, and he's just like waiting to get his hands on that sweet Irish loot, right? And so they get close to the shore, and they come up to the place that Inkel has chosen, the one place in all of Ireland that he has chosen as his target that they must help him plunder. Is and it? it <laughs> what could it be? Uh, could it possibly uh, be? Uh, um, okay, I know this one. <laughs> the land of the Southern O'Neills. <laughs> yeah, fuck them. It is not. What? In fact, it is Dajerga's hostel. <gasps> <laughs> Surprise, I know. All right, so as the ships come near to the shore where the hostel is, there is a great loud clap like a thunder strike. And the sonic impact of this clack is so great that it pushes the ships back out to shore. They're like, what the hell was that? And they realize that it could only be the sound of the flintstone of Makhekt. Makhekt. Which is King Konora's right-hand man, his great battle warrior. Oh, so we still get a big epic battle at the end. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. The, oh, yes. The epic battle is coming. Yes. So they realize that it must be the strike of the flint of his right-hand man, Mekhekt. So at this point, the sons of Dondesha get this uneasy feeling in their stomachs, right? Then as they sail back and they come closer again to the hostel, and they can see that there are horses and chariots and well-appointed wagons, all decked out like only a king could afford, they get even more uneasy, because they see what's coming. Right, because right? they think they're just plundering a hostel instead of it being the king. But now they start to realize, mm-hmm, and then they see a great bright firelight coming from the windows of the hostel, Uh-oh. of a fire so bright that it could only be made by a king. Bing! Mm-hmm. <laughs> Case break number eight. He still hasn't killed any birds. Yeah, he's doing okay on well, that front. Well, yeah, of, of the eight. Of the yeah, eight no, I, I know that it is. Yes, I think he's got like maybe 30 in total, but these okay. eight, he breaks all of them in one day, right? So at that point, they know what's up. And the sons of Dondesha's hearts just sink into their belly. And they say to Enko, we can't do this. 
The king is in there. The high king of all of Ireland is in that hostel. We cannot plunder this hostel. But Inkel is like, a king, you say? <laughs> and he taps his fingers together. You know, he's like, this has got to be my lucky day. It's not every day that you get to plunder a king. A high king, no less. I'm picturing him as the mountain who rides from Game of Thrones. <laughs> the mashup is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but the sons of Dondesha are like, yeah, but you don't understand. This is our foster brother. This is King Conora, our foster brother. We can't kill our own kin. But Inko is like, well, I offered up my own father and mother and sisters and brother for your plundering. This should be nothing compared to the sacrifice that I have made. You will go through with this. I mean, granted, I was laughing for the whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> but I did most of it, and I did the thing with the heads, but... Yeah, so basically, the sons of Dondesha are silenced. But they try to warn the king. When they land on the shore, they build a beacon fire and a cairn of stones made from one stone from each of the raiders in the plunderer's party. Each one brings a stone, and they build up this cairn. And that is this little just-so story moment here. That is why, ever after... Fires and cairns are built on the night of Samhain, which mm. is sort of a post-harvest festival in Irish lore. Ah. Yes. So, next title card, and we're getting close to the end now. <laughs> it's getting to the climax uh -huh. here. The music's getting great. Inkel spies the hostel and reports back. goes to find out what exactly they can expect inside the hostel. He goes to reconnoiter, right? Being a sneaky kind of guy that his buttocks as big as a cheese. And a, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, huge, <laughs> cumbersome He's got like this, like, like badonga dong going along <laughs> the seashore that's like, he's <laughs> going to spy all quiet, like, this is me being sneaky. <laughs> Yeah, Not but remember the fact that he can't ever stop maniacally laughing. I'm assuming. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but remember that he has that one eye with seven pupils, right? And the way he does this, I gather that maybe he can even like magically like take his eye out and send it through the hostel because somehow he gets he sees all the rooms inside it. Is this like some kind of beholder thing where each of the pupils gets its own separate room? I don't know. It's weird. It's weird. Wait, okay. But he goes to spy on them. Later. And then he comes back and he reports what he saw inside the hostel, right? And each time, one of the sons of Don Desha, one of them named Lomna the Buffoon, <laughs> he's not one of the Foster Brothers, but he's one of the sons of Don okay. Desha. So he get, they get the description and then Lomna identifies, oh shit, it's this guy, you know? And then he's like, oh, we're all dead for sure, basically. So this is the Steve Buscemi character. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, let's call this cast Steve Buscemi in this one. <laughs> he's like... <laughs> oh, we're yeah, going to die like... for sure. <laughs> What's the guy's name? That's McKeck. This is Lomna the buffoon. Shut up, Lomna. So he's first, a child. So first, Inkel describes a man... And it's posed in the form of a riddle, basically. Like, he describes what it's like. And you have to imagine that, like, in medieval Ireland, when they recite this epic, then, like, there's somebody listening. And they've heard the story before, right? So you start to tell the riddle, and there's like, oh, it's him, it's him, I know it's him, you know? So it's this performance thing, So there's right? a kid yelling, and somebody's yeah. shushing the kid. In the yeah, he's like, no, shh, let him finish. Yeah. So here's the riddle. So tell us the riddle. Yeah, so the first person he sees, he sees... Two bare hills were there by the man with hair. Two lochs, like Scottish lochs, like lakes, mm -hmm. right? By a mountain of the... And then there's an ellipsis indicating that this is one of those poems called a rosk that's nearly untranslatable because it has double meanings. Right? right. But we only get one of the So meanings. it's a description of him, but they're yes. playing it like a landscape. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Two lochs by a mountain of the... Dot, dot, dot. Of a blue-fronted wave two hides by a tree, two boats near them full of thorns of a white thorn tree on a circular board, and there seems to me somewhat like a slender stream of water on which the sun is shining, and it's trickled down from it. And String a, or nothing! <laughs> <laughs> and a hide arranged behind it, and a palace house post shaped like a great lance above it. The life cycle of man. Grapes. <laughs> Apples. Very small rocks. <laughs> you guys guessing who this is? Cider. Try to... Get the riddle? 
A good weight of a plow yoke is the shaft that is therein. Hmm, that's what I heard. <laughs> and then one of the sons of Dondesha, Ferrogan, says, Easy me seems to liken him. Like, he's got the answer, yeah. right? That is Makhekt. Makhekt. You remember Makhekt? The biggest. Of course. Yes, Slam. the guy with the flint stone. How could we forget Makhekt? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, the right-hand man of King Conora. That is Makhekt, son of Snaitha Tehid, the battle soldier of Conora, son of Ederskel. Good is the hero Makhekt. Supine was he in his room, in his sleep, when thou beheldest him. The two bare hills which thou sawest by the man with hair, these are his two knees by his head. So he must have been, he like... sleeps all folded up. sleeps all, like, in fetal position mm. in his bed, with his <laughs> knees by his head. That's why they saw hills by the hair. He's yes. seen some shit. That's yeah. how he gets through. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the two lochs by the mountain which thou sawest, these are his two eyes by his nose. <laughs> so his eyes are like lakes, apparently. The two hides by a tree which thou sawest, these are his two ears by his head. The two five thwarted boats on a circular board which thou sawest, these are his two sandals on his shield. The slender stream of water which thou sawest, whereon the sun shines and it's trickled down from it, this is the flickering of his sword. <laughs> oh, a sword? Wait, is that a metaphor? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know. Other things could be flickering or trickling. Mm, <laughs> The hide which thou sawest arranged behind him, that is his sword scabbard. The palace house post which thou sawest, that is his lance. And he brandishes his spear till its two ends meet. And he hurls a willful cast of it when he pleases. Good is the hero, Makhakt. So his breasts are like two gazelles and nursing the hunts of Gilead. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes on and on and on like that. But basically... It goes on through all of the king's retinue. And it's kind of cool because you get to see the cross-section of who would be in King Conor's retinue. Can that be a stretch goal if someone gives us enough on Patreon? They just get a bonus episode of you reading <laughs> all through all of this. All of the rooms. <laughs> yep. That would be more like a punishment. <laughs> Remember, you paid for this. <laughs> so anyway, one of them is another hero named Conal Karnak, who will come back in the story. Okay. But he has this blonde Irish, like, curly hair. So he's the fro guy. Okay. <laughs> and he's also the one who Conora loves above all else. Okay? Then beyond all of that, there are warriors, there are stewards, there are harpers, there are jugglers, there are mimes. Kill the jugglers I, and the mimes Yeah, first. the jugglers and the mimes described <laughs> in the same way with the riddle for each one. And... Well, when they go through each one, they prophesy how many people that person is going to kill. And it's like, 60 for this guy, 100 for that guy. And they get to the jugglers, they're like, one between them. <laughs> <laughs> and the same for the mimes. And then there's the satire poets. And then there's the charioteers, and so on down the line. Well, satire's dead already, so... <laughs> <laughs> and for each of them, the sons of Dondesha are like, oh man, come on, we're gonna die for sure. Oh shit, that's the worst mime in the <laughs> whole kingdom. That mime has mimed such a mime. That satirist is flayed, man. <laughs> but each time, Inkul has to upbraid them and remind them of their oath to plunder with him. And then he says this rosk that Andre on a previous episode actually read to us that begins with, Clouds of weakness come to you. Nela fevi dohikas, vingir guanes gal ruin gaur. Her frisch la Louis für Rohan Rihes. Rogob do gu moyem fortsu alone. A drok like su roet the tar. Nela fe he doikat. Nela fe he doikat. Nela fe he doikat. It cannot be prevented. Clouds of weakness take you. The slaughter will destroy two great heroes. It will drive Ferrogan to break his word. It will drive Ferrogan to flee. I hear your voice breaking, O Lomna. Are you afraid to fight? Clouds of weakness take it. And foretells the things will happen if you don't fulfill your plunder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you do not slaughter that cleaning lady. Mm -hmm. Now, finally, Inkel comes to describing the room of King Konora. 
There I beheld a room, more beautifully decorated than the other rooms of the house, a silvery curtain around it, and there were ornaments in the room, and I beheld a trio in it. The outer two of them were, both of them, fair, with their hair and eyelashes, and they are as bright as snow, a very lovely blush on the cheek of each of the twain, a tender lad in the midst between them. The ardor and energy of a king has he, and the counsel of a sage. So the Conora is the tender I, lad. Right. Yeah. The mantle I saw around him is even as the mist of May Day. Diverse are the hue and semblance each moment shown upon it. So he seems to have some kind of technicolor dream coat or something. Yeah. <coughs> it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Lovelier is each hue than the other. In front of him in the mantle I beheld a wheel of gold which reaches from his chin to his navel. The color of his hair was like the sheen of smelted gold, so blonde hair. Of all the world's forms that I beheld, this is the most beautiful. I saw his golden-hilted glaive down beside him, some kind of spear or polearm weapon. A forearm's length of the sword was outside the scabbard. That forearm, a man down in the front of the house, could see a flesh worm by the shadow of the sword. What? <laughs> I don't know. It's getting more and more metaphorical as we go. Yeah. Sweeter is the melodious sounding of the sword than the melodious sound of the golden pipes that accompany music in the palace. God, that's a sweet flesh worm sword. <laughs> it's pl plus one, plus five versus flesh worm exactly. or something. Are you sure this is a Tarantino or is this turning into a porn? It might be. Mm -hmm. Well, he was he was sleeping between two guys. Yeah, yeah. and the one-eyed monster is awfully taken with this. Yeah, this might yeah. be a, a slash version. Where did it, what website did I get this off? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I might have to check into this. Why is everyone oiled in this recanting? <laughs> so then he asked the sons of the Dondesha, like, yeah, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Right. Well, we've run through everyone else. I don't know, man. <laughs> So Ferogan says, easy for me to liken him. No conflict without a king, this. He is the most splendid and noble and beautiful and mighty king that has come into the whole world. He is the most splendid and noble and beautiful and mighty king that has come into the whole world. He's a dish. <laughs> he is the mildest and gentlest and most perfect king that has come to it, even Conora, son of Eterskel. Tis he that is over king of all Erin. There is no defect in that man, whether in form or shape or vesture. And we've all seen him naked, <laughs> walking up to Tara. <laughs> whether in size or fitness or proportion, whether in eye or hair of brightness, whether in wisdom or skill or eloquence, whether in weapon or dress in appearance, whether in splendor or abundance or dignity, whether in knowledge or valor or kindred. His dad's a seagull. <laughs> Six hundred will fall by Conora before he shall attain his arms, and seven hundred will fall by him in his first conflict after attaining his arms. I swear to God what my tribe swears, unless drink be taken from him, though there be no one else in the house but he alone, he would hold the hostel until help would reach it, which the man would prepare from him, from the wave of Klizna and the wave of Asaro, while ye are at the hostel. And if he chance to come upon you out of the house, as numerous as hailstones and grass on a green will be your halves of heads and your cloven skulls and your bones under the edge of his sword. So this is something more like the ending of Scarface, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, all right, I know that I'm fucking doomed, but I'm going to take this missile launcher. And... Yep. <sighs> Who's going to end up shooting him in the back? All right. So, the final title card. The Battle. All right, so we cut to inside the hostel in Conora's room. Shh! Silence a while, says Conora. What is this? And Conal Karnak, the one with the Irish blonde fro. Oh, yeah, the pretty boy. Yeah. Says, 
champions at the house. And Konora is like, oh, there are warriors for them here. Like He's got guards posted all around and stuff. He's like, eh, whatever. But Konal says, they will be needed tonight. Then the attack comes. There are mimes and jugglers for them here. <laughs> <laughs> the sons of Dondesha attack with all of their party of raiders and plunderers. And Loam the Buffoon rushes in first and dies immediately. <laughs> he, gets, by a mime. <laughs> he gets his head cut off right away. <laughs> I'm getting it over with. <laughs> yeah, and then after that, there's a full pitched combat, and they it's like a room by room battle. So at this point, I'm almost imagining it like the game Munchkin, oh, <laughs> where you like boy. kick down the door and see what's inside. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they proceed room to room, and in the midst of all this, the hostel is set on fire three times, and three times it is put out with water and drink from the inside. Right, then finally. The fight reaches the room of King Konara. And they burst in, right? Here we have like the scene from the beginning, yeah. right? So they kick down the door and they burst in and they see Konara in his like linen nighty or whatever it is. And it, but he doesn't Wasn't have. Wasn't he wearing a glorious multicolored frock with a wheel, big golden wheel on it? Yeah. yeah. Shimmering. Plus a nighty, I guess. I guess he wears. Maybe that's part of his pajamas. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But he also has this linen thing gone. It said that too, right? Is right. it commando? <laughs> mm, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, they kick down the door, and there's this like moment of meeting eyes, right? And Konara and his men, they were just asleep. I don't know how they were, like, they hadn't heard the commotion outside and prepared by this time, but it must have happened super quick. But anyway, they don't have their weapons yet. They're still in the corner. So they're barehanded. And then, I suppose, like, a Pop-Tart goes off. <laughs> and then everybody starts fighting. Yeah. <laughs> like, the Pop-Tart goes off with the toaster and everybody starts fighting. <laughs> Mine! <laughs> and Konara, before he can get to his weapon... He has to use his bare hands, and he kills 600. Oh, that's not very bad. That <laughs> what kind of only, heroism is that? Only 600? Yeah. yeah. Then he finally reaches his weapon, and he kills another 600. So he's got 1,200 already to so his hand. So this marauding party, this is pretty much an invasion, if we're inferencing just by what he's knocked off versus what all of his retainers have knocked <laughs> yeah. off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like thousands of men. This is not a marauding party. This is an invasion. <laughs> well, you know how... Medieval literature likes to exaggerate the numbers into, like, crazy. Uh. Yeah. Well, anyway. Okay. So, the title of battle is starting to turn against the plunderers, okay? Who begin to panic and rout. But at that point, the wizards among the plunderers... What? What's the difference between them and the druids? Are they different things? I don't know, but this is being written down in Christian times, so I right. think they probably mean we, druids. You mentioned druid earlier. Druids the don't I'm wear wondering. hats. Yeah, okay. yeah. And have to be turned into a film, but... yeah. So anyway, the wizards slash druids yeah. among oh, sorry, them oh, say of King Konara, they say, short will his time be. Short will his time be. And then they cast a spell on him. And then, in the midst of the fighting, right, it's hack and slash, and ha, ha, and then suddenly, Konara turns to his man, Makhecht, and he says, Makhecht, I'm thirsty. Go get me a drink. <laughs> and like, and not what I'm here for. <laughs> exactly. He's like, what? <laughs> he's like, what? Are you crazy? In the midst of a battle? Like, he's still, like, fighting us. He's, like, uh -huh. coming in to talk to him. He's, like, killing people, stabbing, you know? And he's like, you've got cupbearers for that. Why would you send me to go... <laughs> go send them to get you a drink. You know where I'm the trying ocean to defend spray you is. Here. <laughs> I don't want more Mr. Fib. <laughs> Yeah, so he sends the cupbearers, but they report back that all the water and all the drink in the hostel has been used to put out the fires, and there's nothing left to mm. give him a drink. So Conora says, A drink to me, O foster of Mekhecht, tis equal to me what death I shall go to, for anyhow I shall perish. So basically it's like, I'm fucked anyway because I've broken all my case in one day. I'm goddamn and so thirsty. at least I'm going to get a drink before I goddamn die. <laughs> So, Mekect is like, oh, jeez. And he calls to the other warriors, and he's like, who wants to go get a drink? Because I'm busy here. <laughs> and Conal, the Irish fro guy, says, he asked you, you go do it. <laughs> so, Mekect... There's a rivalry thing going on <laughs> yeah. here. 
And it actually says passive, in the text, yeah. it actually says in the text that ever after this, Conal keeps a grudge against Mekhecht and has a feud with him ah. because of that. So anyway, Mekhecht is like, fine. And he has to fight his way out of the hostel. So he's like hacking and slashing <laughs> to get out of the hostel so he can go and get this guy a damn drink. Right? Like, How am I going to carry this back in without <laughs> spilling it? So he goes... Yeah, I hope it's a sippy cup. Yeah. <laughs> Got a big gulp. Yeah. <laughs> big gulp, Slurpee, <laughs> from the Seven Eleven. Got me blue raspberry. And like shit, they knocked over the Seven Eleven yeah. earlier. And where can I go next? Yeah, <laughs> plundered like hours ago. Hope you like well water. <laughs> well, speaking of which, Ooh. that's coming. So anyway, he brings the the king's golden cup out. So maybe it's the king's golden sippy cup. <laughs> <laughs> so he brings it out in his offhand, fighting with his right hand. And he beats Cheeks to the nearest river to go and fetch water for the king to drink. But somehow, magically, the water refuses to fill his cup. The water hides from him. And he cannot fill the cup to the brim. So he goes to the next river, and then to the next. And each time, the same thing happens. He cannot fill the cup to the brim. And he goes to all the rivers in Ireland, and then all the lakes, and he cannot fill the cup. So he's like, ha, 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 all across the island. He's like, shit, got to get the king his drink so I can go back and fight and save him, right? I'm thinking this is really McKeck's worst day more than anything <laughs> yeah. else. Yeah. It's like, on the one like, hand, you get to kill 1,200 men and die heroically and tragically. <laughs> on the other hand, you have to miss out on the battle to go to every lake and river in Ireland to not be able to fill the damn cup. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so anyway... Meanwhile, back at the battle, the battle rages on all night long as McKecht is getting a frickin' drink for the guy. And the tide turns again, this time against the king. His men fight hard, and they kill many of the plunderers, but at last, one by one, they are being slain. Okay, back to McKecht. <laughs> <laughs> running, running, running. And finally, he reaches Urangarad, a holy well in the province of Connacht, which is way the hell on yeah, the other the side of Ireland. The water there, too, hides from him. But then a wild duck rises up out of the water, and McKecht, in response to this, rejoices and recites a lay. And thereafter, he is able to fill the king's cup up to the brim. Okay. Uh, I don't know. The lay works. Because his king never killed a bird? I don't know. Because he sang a song? I don't know. But anyway, then he hightails it back to the fight. <laughs> He's almost there. He, like, peaks the last ridge to the point where he can then see the hostel in the distance, right? Comes after that ridge, and he sees the fight now carrying on outside the hostel, and he sees that it's down to, on the king's side, he sees that it's down to just the king and three other men fighting what's left of the plunderers, mm -hmm. right? And they're desperately trying to f defend him. And McKecht rushes forward with the filled cup, but alas, it is too late. The king is hopelessly fighting two on one, and then there's this slow motion scene, right, where one of the plunderer's swords slices through the air, and it makes contact with the king's neck, and it cuts clean through. So... And I'm calling it, this being an ancient Irish story, the king's <laughs> severed head is just still going to be a character, right? <laughs> you just wait. So it cuts clean through, and then everybody falls silent, right? As the head goes tumble, tumble, tumble to the ground. And McHecht is like, no! <laughs> right? And he throws himself at the two plunderers that did it, and he butchers one of them immediately with his sword like an animal, and the other one sees this and is like, ah! And he grabs the king's head, and runs away, but McKecht takes a stone from the ground and hurls it at him, like Crocodile Dundee style, and gets him in the back and breaks his back, and he goes down. Ooh. The head goes down. And him. he does all this while still not spilling a drop. <laughs> still cup, not, while well, still not spilling a drop from the cup. That's great I, inner ear balance. Yeah, I've got to say, I think McKecht is probably an even more, even greater cup bearer than he is a warrior. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. He missed like, his calling. Yeah, the greatest waiter ever. <laughs> <laughs> then, gentlemen, gentlemen. Yes. Then McKecht falls to his knees beside the dead king's corpse, and he pulls out the golden cup, which, yes, he's still full to the brim. 
and he pours the water onto the bloody stump of a neck. That's all that's left where the head once was. And then, suddenly, da da <laughs> the decapitated head, a ways off now because yeah. he's carried away, right? Reanimates, Ugh. but not for long. It comes back just long enough to say... A good man, Makhecht. An excellent man, Makhecht. A good warrior without, good within. He gives a drink. He saves a king. He doth a deed. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, he ended the champions I found. He sent a flagstone on the warriors. Well, he hewed by the door of the hostel. Fair lay, so that a spear is against one hip. Good should I be to the far-renowned Makhecht if I were alive. Uh, a good man. And then, eh. postscript. <laughs> Why does this water taste like duck? <laughs> and then, finally, the head dies. Yes. And so expires Konara, king of Tara. And I thought he lived this time. <laughs> and then, Macaque, who survived, looks around, and there's this like gone with the wind moment with like the crane shot where it shows all of the carnage, you right. know, all the dead bodies. And out of the 5,000 plunderers that attacked, only five of them escape. Among them is Inkel. Figures. <laughs> well, he's got to make it back for the sequel, right? Right. Yeah, volume two. <laughs> yeah. Macaque's so Revenge. He re <laughs> Wrecked Macaque. <Maquette. Yeah. laughs> he returns to England and is crowned king of England for his exploits in Ireland. But the three foster brothers of Conora did not escape. They are among the slain. They all died that night, along with all the other plunderers who came from Ireland. And on Conora's side, almost all of them fell as well. Only Macaque and Conal Karnach, the fro guy, mm -hmm. and maybe a few others, it was kind of unspecific, they're survived. They're yeah. mimes, who gives yeah. a... So finally, the aftermath. <laughs> Follow me to the other side through the unfortunate events of a love gone for the world. Thereafter, Macaque, having cleansed the slaughter at the end of the third day, set forth and he dragged Konora with him on his back, the corpse. What did and he do with the head? I'm sure he's got both of it, presumably. Okay. Yeah, both of he them. just bound up his arms and bound his head around the arms. And, yeah. you know. okay. he, he probably put it in the cup. because The cup's empty at that That's point. point. So. Yeah. Anyway. See, so if this he, were Welsh, the head would just be talking to him the whole way. The whole the time. time. <laughs> like, wow, that was quite a night, wasn't it, McKecht? <laughs> so why did it take you so long? Give me a drink. Exactly. Seriously. You suck. Well, there's this thing with a duck. And... <laughs> Wait, this is duck water? I have a guess about that. <laughs> so anyway, he buries Conora's corpse at Tara, some say. Then Mekhecht departed into Connacht, which was his own country. That uh -huh, he might... That's where he knows where to get the good duck water there. <laughs> yeah. That he might work his cure in Macbrengar, wherefore the name clave to the plain from Mekhecht's misery, that is, Macbrengar. Now, Conal Karnak the fro guy, escaped from the hostel as well, and thrice fifty spears had gone through the arm which upheld his shield. He fared forth till he reached his father's house with half his shield in his hand and his sword and the fragments of his two spears. Then he found his father, who was named Avergan, before his garth in Taltu. Swift are the wolves that have hunted thee, my son, saith the father. "'Tis this that has wounded us, thou old hero, in evil conflict with warriors,' Colonel Karnak replied. "'Yeah, I got that. It's being metaphorical. Jeez. <laughs> "'Hast thou then news of Dejerga's hostile?' asks Avergan. "'Is thy lord alive?' <sighs> "'Alas, he is not alive,' says Colonel. "'And then the father is like, "'I swear to God what the great tribes of Ulaid swear, which is the Ulster tribes.' Mm -hmm. It is cowardly for the man who went there out alive, having left his lord with his foes in death. Like, you're coming out alive and your king is dead? You should have died there with him. 
Well, and the Ulstermen are known for being the most badass martial warriors. Mm-hmm. Of okay, Ireland, Dad, yeah. Dad, shut up. The entire hostile Dad, everybody <laughs> Dad. <laughs> like, you're tearing me apart. <laughs> <laughs> I got tired, Dad. So anyway, Conal says, My wounds are not white, thou old hero. And he shows him. And he says, basically, they're not healed up like scars. Right. They're like still red and bleeding. Like, I just got these wounds. And he shows him his shield arm where thrice fifty wounds, and this is what was inflicted upon it. The shield that guarded it is what saved it, but the right arm had been played upon, and as far as two-thirds thereof, since the shield had not been guarding it, so his other arm, I guess, Mm -hmm. that arm was mangled and maimed and wounded and pierced, save that the sinews kept it to the body without separation. So it's just dangling there by the sinews. Can I get some Bactine, please? (laughs) And Avergon, at that point, is like, okay, props. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) you're mutilated, fine. He's like, that arm fought tonight, my son. (laughs) He's like, yep, okay, yeah, you you fought well. True is that, thou old hero, says Colonel Karnak. Which is basically, fuck you. Yeah, dead, thanks. I know, I know, dad. (laughs) Many there are unto whom it gave drinks of death tonight in front of the hostel. Unlike that bastard McKechnie just gave a drink of duck water. <laughs> yeah. Ran away from the whole battle. Let's go yeah. feed with him, Dad. <laughs> now, as to the reavers, the plunderers, every one of them that escaped from the hostel went to the cairn that they had built on the night before last, where they built the bacon fire. Each one of them brought one stone to the cairn, 5,000 of them. Mm-hmm. And they brought there out a stone for each man not mortally wounded. So this is what they lost by death at the hostel, a man for every stone that is now in Cairn Leka. So you can Which imagine... Which you know, is big and full of stones. Yeah, I, am, I imagine that this was something still around, that people hearing this epic could go and be like, this is that huge thing full of stones and that many people died, you know? Yeah. And then the last line is simply, it endeth, amen, it endeth. And that is the destruction of De Gierga's Hostel, as directed by Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, roll credits, right? Yeah. So that was a much better telling than what I did the first time I tried it. Hey, it's a tradition. <laughs> See, if I were doing it, I'd have the whole scene between Connell Cernick and his dad be the stinger after the credits. Oh, oh, yeah, maybe we should make it that way. You run the credits, and yeah. then suddenly you just see this guy with his <laughs> big throw and his arm hanging off his body, held on by sinews. And... Why don't you have a good grace to die? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anyway, well, that's it for this episode, folks. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to our whole monster epic length series on the medieval Irish geish. It endeth. Amen. It endeth. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be back next time with something a little different before we dive into our next series. See you next time, everybody. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is Dead Ideas. <laughs> be sure to support the show at www.patreon.com forward slash deadideaspod, where you can get great perks like your portrait drawn in the time period and culture of your choosing.